I was actually intending to record more videos while the Overwatch League went on and maybe release some videos on my YouTube channel, you know, while Owl was going on the days that they were live so that people would have something to watch while they were waiting, uh, you know, for the game that they wanted or whatever. But unfortunately, I've been caught up with the uh, the stream that I've been running, uh, which I think if you're a fan of my YouTube but don't know that I stream, you'd probably enjoy checking that out as well. I do live analysis of the Overwatch League games while they're going on and while I'm stuck over here with my visa. Uh, you run it at the same time as the Overwatch League stream is going on. There's no Overwatch League content on my stream, but it's just me giving some supplemental kind of like director's commentary over what I think of uh, the games that are happening. And I think that 2019, the Overwatch season that we're watching right now, can be described in a number of ways. Uh, one of the ways that we have been exploring um, is the expansion teams against the old guard, if you want to put it like that, the teams that were already there from 2018. And at the moment, the expansion teams are doing incredibly well. So that's one way of framing it. But the one that I want to talk about right now is the battle of the coaches, is thinking about each of these teams in the as if they are products of their coaching staff rather than thinking of them as rosters run by the players or use, utilizing their player strengths i think it's really interesting to model each team as the brainchild of its coaching staff um and although it's not a perfectly accurate model it brings up really interesting questions so in 2018 we saw some teams that had defined very clear and identifiable good coaching it's always a difficult topic to address, for starters, because you never quite know what's going on behind the scenes. You hear whispers from t uh, from players, and you see stuff in interviews, or you can talk to the coaches sometimes, or at least I can because I'm involved in the league itself. But uh, teams tend to be fairly resistant to hand out clear details of what their coaches do um, for a variety of reasons. First, being strategic, they don't want to say exactly who uh, who is making all the strats and exactly what each person does. They don't want to give away too much of the inner workings of the team. And secondly, just for reasons of being kind to the other people you work with. If, uh, if one coach is the fucking ultra giga brain of the entire team, then it would be fairly non-PR friendly for him to come out and just claim that he's, you know absolute genius carrying the team on his back because it makes the rest of his coaching staff look worse in comparison. So teams tend not to do that kind of stuff. I mean, Wizard Yong does, but he's a special case, isn't he? <laughs> um, so to talk about some of the best coaching that we saw in 2018, I think there were really three teams that embodied the idea of this. Um, and I think the most obvious to me might not be the most obvious to everybody else, but the most obvious to me was the LA Valiant. Um, and the reason for this is, when you think about how the LA Valiant played last year, they really didn't have that much star talent across their team. A lot of other teams we were looking at and we were saying, wow, X pops off, you know, uh, Profit and Gesture, unbelievable skill. Uh, NYXL, the way we play around Jonak, that's fantastic. He's such a star player. Um, Fissure on the LA Gladiators. But LA Valiant were quiet. And yet they still managed to get to second place in the regular standings, uh, uh, in the regular season standings. Um, and the fact that they were able to do that whilst passing somewhat under the radar, I think perfectly um, shows what well-coached teams can often look like, which is that they are just incredibly cohesive in terms of how their team works together. They rarely make mistakes. Their positioning is very good. They're able to win fights without it looking like anybody had to pop off because they're always in the right place and getting most out of their abilities and their positioning and how they take the fights. Uh, so LA Valiant really looked to me like a team that was very on point with their coaching. Um, especially when we were looking more towards the playoffs matter and stuff like that because they were really the team that defined it. Now, they didn't do very well in the playoffs. I think their players individually choked there. But even so, from talking to the coaches and looking at how this team played, it seemed like very strong coaching staff. The second team is probably one that everybody will think of, which is the Boston Uprising. These guys went on a 14-match win streak with a roster that people thought at the beginning of the league would be really towards the bottom of the table. Um, they managed to scout really good talent, which is a, a boon to the coaching staff that happens even before the season really begins. Then they managed to really hone in on how to play dive compositions incredibly aggressively and incredibly well coordinated. Um, managed to break a lot of anti-dive comps that had the Junkrat and the Widow and these kind of things. Um, and even managed to keep that system going after they had a disastrous loss of their main kind of captain figure in Dreamcasper who was removed from the league for 
good reason. Um, so fantastic coaching from them. Very difficult to tell who was responsible for what. And I'll get onto that later because I'm going to talk about some of the individual coaches that were in the scene. But just to set up the fact of, you know, some coaches and some teams that did really well last season, Boston have to be mentioned. The third one, again, is quite an obvious one, I think. It's NYXL. This team, yes, they have some of the best players in the entire league, but they didn't just kind of skill their way through the matches they were so dominant so precise with how they played overwatch it was a stranglehold on enemy teams and slowly constricted them perfect positioning from all of their players um and really nice teamwork with a with a new style as well that their coaching staff had uh, created and implemented and obviously people know wizard young as uh, as the man behind that but again it's quite difficult to to be able to give credit there because it's difficult to see whose responsibility was whose, especially when we're a Western Anglophone audience and Wizard Chong is really the only person on that roster that speaks uh, fluent English to the level where they frequently engage with PR. Um, but having said that, Pavane's English is actually coming along really well. Uh, another team that I'm going to give credit to is, strangely, the Dallas Fuel. Because when Dallas went into Stage 4... A lot of the talk was around improvement underneath that new coaching staff that they brought in with Aero. Um, I think that Aero did do a lot of work for them. I think what you also have to keep in mind there is the meta change that happened that allowed Reinhardt-centric compositions back into the meta, allowed Harry Hook to play Lucio rather than the Mercy, allowed them to throw kind of weird Reaper picks and uh, let Mickey on Brigitte instead of Diva where he wasn't having the best performances. Um, so I think... There's another situation in which coaching actually had a big role within Dallas, and you can start to model teams like that. And uh, before I get into kind of the bulk of the video as well, I want to give a shout out to Philadelphia Fusion, who, while they do play an incredibly chaotic, or did play back in 2018, an incredibly chaotic, DPS-centric style of Overwatch, um, they don't get talked about too much in terms of their coaching, because they have so much raw potential, and only sometimes fulfill it. So... You can look at that in some sense as a failure from the coaching staff, perhaps, because they haven't really drilled discipline into these guys, and they do seem to crumble sometimes under high-pressure situations, and they're, they're a bit all over the place. But incredibly good scouting is what I want to give them credit for. These guys were the last team to join the league in 2018. Didn't really have the pick of the litter, if you want to say that because a lot of other teams had already solidified their starting roster had to pick players from Europe and from different areas like Sado who were you know looked over or you know people didn't want to pick him up because of his boosting past or stuff like that um so great scouting from them and they did do well coaching in the playoffs I think as the season went on the coaching got better and they actually looked like a fairly solid team when it got to the playoffs they weren't playing too scrappily you know each player really knew where they were supposed to be as I alluded to before, though, there are some real unanswered questions from 2018. Um, the biggest of these, I think, revolves around the Boston Uprising. Boston Uprising are notoriously tight-lipped with, with information that they give about the inner workings of their team. Huck very rarely engages with outside press. Um, he very rarely engaged with inside press inside the league. So he went, she was working as an insider last season. It was like trying to get blood out of a stone when it came to some of these teams. And the Boston Uprising were one of them. They seem very hesitant to give away the inner workings of Boston. Now, we heard some stuff in the offseason about inner turmoil within their team, clashes in terms of personality and coaching styles between Huck and Krusty, and that the split between the Korean and the Western uh, players on the team as well. So perhaps there was good reason for keeping some stuff uh, quiet in that sense, you know, not to let all of your uh, dirty laundry air to the public. Um, but it has made it very difficult to be able to tell who was the brain behind Boston. If I had to guess based on... Okay, so some more context for anybody who's not familiar as well. Krusty left during... Uh, I think he left during stage three and went to coach the San Francisco Shock. So I think he'd put a lot of stuff in place um, and really imparted a lot of knowledge of how to play dive to his team. And they certainly looked very good towards the end of stage one at dive. Uh, good throughout stage two in dive. And then were unbeaten, went on a 10... Uh, you know, uh, the undefeated stage, which no other team was able to do throughout 2018 in stage three. Um, so once he left, we got to a little bit of insight into what Krusty was able to do in other teams and what they said about him and what Huck was still able to do within Boston. And so 
to speculate a little bit based on the evidence that we have available, it seems very likely that Krusty was in charge of a lot of the strategic stuff that made Boston such an excellent dive team. But it seems likely to me that a lot of the ethos around scouting and construction of the team and uh, picking up very unknown players and in somewhat of a money ball approach where he's really trying to pick, you know, the absolute best value for money and see what they can get out of it um, seems to come from Huck. Um, and the fact that Boston now have supplemented their roster with uh, Gunber, who used to work for the LA Valiant, um, and they still have a couple of other people as well, picked up somebody else whose name I can't remember, but still have Huck there too. Um, indicates to me that they'll keep some kind of a similar ethos. Uh, but that's a big unanswered question from 2018 and will be an interesting thing to follow. Can Boston really have the same success uh, when they don't have Krusty around? And will Krusty be able to have the same success with his new team? Another big unanswered question from 2018 is, was Wizard Hyong really the brain behind NYXL? Uh, certainly he's very... Um, uh, what's a good word to describe Wizard Hyong? He's very confident in his own genius. And I'm saying that without a shred of humor. He genuinely does seem to believe that he is uh, some of a one of a kind kind of genius in terms of understanding the game. Uh, so certainly this uh, has come across as arrogance at times and, and will be hubris, I'm sure, if uh, his team ends up not performing particularly well this season. But from interactions with him and from how he talks about the game and from certain VOD reviews and stuff like that that he's done and from how highly the NYXL players speak about him, it does seem like he actually does have a very good mind for Overwatch. And I would be surprised if he didn't actually have a very large impact on NYXL. NYXL also does have some very intelligent players anyway, though. These were already some of the best players in the world before coaching was a big thing in Overwatch. Korea was faster than the West to pick up on coaching, but even so, these are some these are the kind of players that know how to play and need some tweaks and some perfection, and you really have to just polish uh, an already existing gemstone uh, when it comes to NYXL. So I don't know whether we'll ever really understand how much impact Wizard Chong had in that team, um, especially because now he's faced with an utterly different challenge. There's also the case that... Oh, fucking hell, that's an enormous spider. Holy Christ. That startled me. Don't know where it went. Okay, whatever. Doesn't matter. Can't hurt me. Um, I'm not in LA anymore. That's why I'm panicking. I've still got... I had to learn to fear wildlife again when I moved to California because there's fucking, like, bears and, like, black widows and brown recluses and shit that can fuck your day up or rattlesnakes. I had a run in with a rattlesnake while I was hiking. It made me appreciate nature again. I, I, I need to get back in the zone of, I'm in the UK, nothing can hurt me. All right, anyway. Uh, there's your comedy segment for the, for the video. Where was I? Okay, so we also had some coaching teams that split up from 2018 to 2019, which will give us some really interesting storylines and comparisons from 2018 to the, this year. And one of them is... Uh, the LA Valiant. So the LA Valiant's coaching team split up into three separate parts. So Moon, the head coach, who I don't think from interacting with... So I, we got a few opportunities to go and talk with the LA Valiant and sit down with their coaches and pick their brains and stuff like that and learn a little bit about how the team was structured in 2018. It seemed like Moon was very good at being able to impose his culture on the team. So very good at task delegation, very good at being able to set up a great environment for the team to succeed, very good at delegating tasks and setting up a hierarchy within the coaching staff and uh, monitoring uh, player mental health and making sure that he asks the right questions at the right time and putting power in the right hands, this kind of stuff that the head coaches, you know, that's one of their main responsibilities. But I wouldn't say that he was the strategic mind behind the LA Valiant. I think a lot of that went into the hands of Gunba and Demon, uh, the two guys that have actually left the LA Valiant to go and join different teams in 2019. So Demon went to become the head coach of Paris Eternal and Gunba went to be assistant coach coach i'm not exactly sure what his title is but i don't think he's head coach i think he so a, a distinction to make here as well is that moon in a head coach position tends to take a step back 
from the strategy and take a more holistic approach to running the team and to making sure the team's in a good place. And Demon has gone from being a strategic coach. Hello? My, uh, my thing went on. Uh, never mind. Demon has, been, has gone from being a strategic coach uh, to uh, being a head coach. So he now has to take a step back and take more a holistic approach. The same applies to, to um, Wizard Hyong. So different challenges when you're in a different coaching um, role. Uh, and from and I think that'll be a very interesting setup to see how LA Valiant performs with the new coaches they brought on. Uh, who is it? Uh, I can't remember the name of the Korean guy that they brought on. Dong Yu, Dong Moon, can't remember. Um, and Packing Ten, uh, both very highly rated um, coaches as well. And we'll see how Gunba and Demon are able to perform in their respective teams. In 2019, there's some really interesting clashes of coaches that I want to look out for as well. Like really big brains battling against each other and very different styles in how they run their teams. And a lot of them have like either pre-existing rivalries or have worked together before. And I think those could be some of the most interesting rivalries in the whole league. So the first one is what I would consider the four big head coaches or like four big daddy coaches of 2019. And these were the four big daddy coaches of 2018. And that's why we know enough about them to call them the four, the big four of 2019, I think. So it could be that there's some other fucking geniuses in 2019. But because we don't, because we didn't see any of their work in 2018, they're going to kind of come out the blue in 2019, so to speak. They might be new, you know, new head coaches that we now really respect. But the four big ones that have carried over from last year are Wizard Hyong, Pervain, who he worked with, Huck, and Krusty. In my opinion, these are the big four coaches to look at in terms of different approaches to the game and looking at the success that they have and how they uh, take experiences from previous teams and apply them to these teams. So Wizard Hyong has gone from being a strategic mind working with the absolute best players in the world and trying to turn them into gods. He's working with the greatest possible raw materials and trying to turn them into fantastic weapons. Now, in 2019, he's really working with some rough uh, material. He's gone from the absolute pinnacle, best raw material possible to really rough kind of uh, an, an earthy, getting your hands dirty really picking up a roster that a lot of people think is pretty poor and making it uh making it a competent one this is a completely different challenge and it's going to be and it and whenever we're thinking about whether or not wizard hyung is actually a good coach or is able to live up to his expectations or his own words you have to take that in the context that he's got a different role on the washington justice and he's working with worse pieces and the best way you possibly slice it, even the hardest core, uh, the most hardcore Washington Justice fan, even the Ju Washington Justice management themselves, I'm sure would admit that their players, the actual players that they're working with, are not on the same level as the NYXL's players. It's a totally different challenge. And so Wizard Hyung has a totally new challenge, much more challenging challenge as well to work with. But I think that's going to be a very interesting storyline to monitor throughout the season. The other one is Pervain, because with Wizard Hyung out of the picture for NYXL, it falls to Pervain to be able... They, they've also brought in a guy called... Uh, fuck, what's he called? IMT, who is apparently a very good analyst that worked in the Korean community and they've brought him in. But I think a lot of it is going to, a lot of the outside uh, optics are going to be focused on Pervain and how well he can still make NYXL run without Wizard Hyung. Uh, Overwatch League ran a fantastic piece at the beginning of the season when NYXL played Justice. By the way, they crushed them. Of course, they fucking did. Um, where they were talking about the loss of Wizard Hyung. And the NYXL players all said he was great, but from the sound of it, it was Wizard Hyung's decision to leave the team. So... Can Pervain still make a very excellent NYXL team that can adapt quickly, that is going to be able to be a dominant team, that's going to be able to be at the top of the pack, is going to play that disciplined, reactive style? We don't know, but it's a great storyline to follow as well. The other one is Huck. So this is our third big daddy head coach. 
Can Huck have the same success with the Boston Uprising? I think personally his scouting has been very good again in 2019. I think picking up fusions before he'd even played in the Overwatch World Cup was a, a prescient, um, a fantastic decision. The He's really come in clutch for, the, for them in the first week of the Overwatch League. I don't know whether Fusions will end up getting play further on down the line. I hear very good things about Axiom as well. So maybe, again, good scouting from Huck or whoever is involved in the scouting with Huck or, you know, alongside him or for him. Uh, can he create a functioning system and can his strategy still be as good without Krusty there alongside him? These are some big questions for Huck to answer. And another boon in, uh, towards him as well is Color Hex. I think this guy's really going to um, be an outstanding undiscovered talent for the Boston Uprising. I don't think he's necessarily going to be one of the best in the league, but I think he's definitely going to be excellent when you consider that nobody was even thinking about signing him to a team as far as i'm aware other than boston so one of those hidden gems you know like uh like striker or dream casper from last year or uh, neko or aim god again uh, aim god fantastic didn't see much of him last season but again great scouting from uh huck or whoever does it on boston to be able to get that so that's a really no another very interesting coaching storyline to follow with the boston uprising the final one is Krusty, and to see what he can get done with the San Francisco Shock. Now, coming into the league, every motherfucker and their nan were high on the San Francisco Shock, apart from some people on Reddit who were calling me out for it. But basically, every expert and everybody behind the scenes and all of the teams said, Shock are a real team to watch out for. They're going to be a powerhouse. They picked up some great players. They picked up Striker. Looks like the organization were happy to just basically give Krusty a blank check to sign whoever he wanted. Um, and also Violet, who looks like one of the most promising uh, up-and-coming Zenyatta players uh, in, in 2019. They also have a really nice system. They play a quad DPS very well, so I'm told, but we haven't seen too much of it yet. They had some excellent set strategies when they played against Dallas. Perhaps they burnt them too early, using them against Dallas in their opening match when they were doing so well already, but... Nevertheless, it says very good things about their coaching. They look like a very cohesive, aggressive team. It did get punished against Gladiators, and this is now where Krusty needs to step up. So many people have given him so much res uh, respect and acknowledgements for his coaching, and I've interacted with him and talked with him for hours, you know, over drinks at a bar, and I can tell you the guy really does know his stuff when it comes to Overwatch and how different metas are played. Very intelligent guy and a very good mind and... Uh, like attitude for being a head coach he really knows how he wants the game to be played and you are going to play his style but he's going to tell you and give you everything you need to do to be able to understand it um, but now you know the pressure is on for shock to be able to adapt from that really I mean it wasn't a crushing loss because they did take it to map five and they could have won the entire series but gladiators hard read their style and so it's on Krusty to make sure that this team has multiple looks so another excellent storyline to be able to follow throughout this season. Here's another one. Bishop and Brad, Sefi, get a second try in the Overwatch League. Now, Bishop was the head coach for uh, London Spitfire. Bishop was not the um, most widely loved person in the community because people blamed him for Cloud9 not being able to get results, which I think was a very silly uh, argument. Bishop really did know his shit. Uh, that team didn't have the best talent. Uh, it had a lot of hyped individuals by Reddit, but it didn't actually have the best talent. I mean, Kaiser really hasn't done anything and wasn't particularly impressive in that meta when he was playing for them. We haven't seen much out of Zephyr as well. He was very highly touted at that time as a player with a lot of potential, but we never saw it actualized and we still haven't. Um, uh, Shawfall sure was good, but still managed to play well. Uh, anyway, the point is, when he came into the London Spitfire as well, uh, he was dealing with two rosters that he had to try and mesh together, had to try and find the best uh, roster available. And Bishop isn't the most... From few interactions that I've had with him, Bishop seems very intelligent and uh, very well-meaning, a lovely guy, but he's not like Krusty, where Krusty is going to tell you, boom, this is how this shit is going to be. And, and Huck definitely is like that as well. I mean, he's a little, <laughs> a little, uh, a little powerful individual. Um, and Wizard Young certainly seems very opinionated. Bishop is much more, I think, 
uh, gentle with his approach. He's, you know, a bit more persuasive and will tell the team how he wants things to be done. But he's not a fucking alpha male where he just walks in and he's like, this is my style, play this style. So I think London was quite a challenge for him, uh, I would speculate, to be able to integrate those two rosters and manage people on the bench like Fisher and like Rascal, who had previously been at the top of their game, and to be able to make that really work. And also, Bishop ended up leaving the team of his own volition, um, uh, it's come out recently, uh, because his mum had uh, cancer issues and he had to go back and, and help her. Uh, she's in remission, he seems to be in a better place where he can focus on Overwatch, and it looks like with the Toronto Defiant, he's going to have another opportunity to prove himself as a competent head coach in the scene. And they're making use of the fact that he's a fluent Korean and English speaker by being able to integrate some Western uh, coaching and strategic ability from uh, Baroy as well. So that's interesting. I like that. Uh, Brad Sefi, the former owner of Selfless, who was the head coach of the San Francisco Shock, um, I've never personally been high on his strategic understanding of the game. Um, I think that the San Francisco Shock were pretty weak in that department coming in, and I think he also made some questionable decisions in hiring for that team. I mean, I certainly wouldn't have hired guys like uh, Duck or Nomi. Um, I would have been hesitant perhaps to hire Baby Bay, but he's ended up being an okay hire for the team. Uh, who else did they have on that roster at the time? Anyway, the, the roster wasn't the greatest and a lot of the good talent they had were wasn't available until like stage three um and but it does seem from recent uh, discussions that brad's been involved in on oversight and uh, content that the atlanta rain have put out that brad really has learned a lot of lessons from the uh, failures and the ups and downs of his time with the San Francisco Shock in the Overwatch League. And he seems much more prepared and has a set philosophy on how he wants the Atlanta Reign to work. He really has gone for some of the best free agents, regardless of where they came from in the league. He really went for players that are of age so that they have the best roster straight out of the gate. He's delegated a lot of the strategic element to some people that he really trusts. Guys like Silence, who he says is one of the most intelligent people he's ever worked with. Um, and Kasoris as well, who I think is a positional coach for this team. Um, so, yeah, it's a second try for him as well. And these people have learned from their past experiences and are going to be able to apply them in Overwatch League 2019 and should be better for it and should be given a second try because nobody fucking knew what Overwatch League was going to be like in 2018. Nobody knew the challenges. Nobody knew exactly what you needed to be able to succeed or what level of skill you required or how you should balance marketing and uh, success to get the absolute best results. So awesome opportunity for both of them and we'll see and we'll monitor that narrative as it goes through. Here's another one. Ryu, the head coach of... Um, wait, is he head coach? I think he is, yeah. I think he's the head coach now of the Chengdu Hunters. And he gets a new, real chance with a full Chinese team. He was previously the head coach of Miraculous Youngster, the best Chinese full Chinese roster there's ever been, in my opinion, um, that was really able to contest these top teams with a unique style. Ryu's really known for his unique twists on things, being able to play, you know, teams having a lot of cohesion, but still being able to play quite cheesy things or interesting uh, and new, uh, unique kind of compositions, but not just in a way where things are chaotic and messy and all over the place, actually in a relatively structured style. And the fact that he gets to do it with a full Chinese roster really is a bit of a redemption story for him because he came into the league with the idea in 2018 of trying to fix the Shanghai Dragons, um, but had to retire after only a couple of weeks, I think, but it might have been a month and a half, something like that, um, for health reasons and went back to uh, went back to Korea or China or somewhere. I don't know. It, Ryu's Chinese, right? Let me just let me just double check this. Yeah, he's Chinese. Yeah, so he must have gone back to China, presumably. I don't know why I thought he went back to Korea for some reason there. Probably because most of the people that had health issues did go back to Korea in 2018 because it was mostly uh, the Korean players that hadn't um, were getting homesick or had mental difficulties or health issues and wanted to go back. Anyway, so Ryu's in a position now where he doesn't have to inherit the mess of the Shanghai Dragons and try and pick up the pieces. He's had an opportunity to build a Chinese team and uh, make it his own. They are struggling at the moment because Jishirin, their main tank, 
and the the only player really that's comfortable playing Winston and Reinhardt on their team is uh, has visa issues and is stuck in China. And the same for YXL, Yang Shaoling. Oh, I hope that's roughly how you pronounce that player's name. Um, who's a hit scan player that used to play with Ryu and some of the other guys on the team in Miraculous Youngster. So they are playing particularly cheesy stuff at the moment. They literally can't play goats as far as I'm aware. They just play Hammond compositions. But it's throwing some teams off their game. They won their opening match for starters, so a good start so far. Uh, and then there's some interesting rivalries to track. So, so far I've talked about, you know, big people and tracking their narrative as they go through 2019. But here's some rivalries for you. When these guys face off, I'm not going to be really thinking about player rivalries or their team records or any shit like that. I'm going to be saying, these coaches have got it in for each other. Let's see how they match up. Let's see what they brought to the table strategically. Let's see the prep work that they did. And let's hear some smack talk afterwards on the opposition's coaches. I think we could get some fantastic coaching rivalries in this league. A big, a big one to start off here is uh, Krusty versus Hook, obviously, is going to be incredible because it seemed like there was a bit of bad blood between them, between that Boston split. Uh, there seemed to be some interpersonal issues in the entirety of Boston in 2018. So Krusty versus Huck is going to be very entertaining when Shock play Boston. Krusty at the moment seems in a much better position with his team, but he does have more uh, more talented players and a bigger paycheck. Uh, not bigger paycheck, but a bigger, you know, like, uh, what do you call it? Bigger budget behind his team, right? So he really should win that one. But I think that'll be an opportunity for him to prove himself strategically and for Boston as the plucky underdogs as ever to maybe be able to prove the fact that they didn't need him. So I think that could be a great rivalry. Another one with Krusty, interestingly, is a guy called Blue Huss, who is, uh, I think, the head coach of the Shanghai Dragons. And Blue Huss, I think, replaced Krusty on WNV Korea, um, which was really where Krusty made his name as a coach. It was a, it was the best team in China, but it was a full Korean team that had gone over to play there in late 2016 and very early 2017. And Blue has replaced him on that team. And I think there's going to be some rivalry there as well. I think Krusty will want to be able to prove himself and say, look, you, I should never have been uh, removed or replaced on that team. I should have been the guy to lead WNV Korea and be renowned for the players that I played with there, like guys like Bedoshin. Um, who else played on that team that was fantastic? Uh, Ding played on that team. Who else? I can't remember anymore. Young Jin played on that team. Uh, players that uh, Blue Hass is now playing with on Shanghai, you know? So really interesting rivalry between these two. Krusty's playing not just against former players that he coached, but a, a coach that he was, you know, in competition with to just have his job in the past. So that's going to be a great rival to, right, uh, rivalry to watch. I think the, the entire... A lot of the storylines around the shock revolve around Krusty, I think, and I'm glad that we built them up in 2018 and gave him credit for that. Some other ones are going to be the LA Valiants current coaching staff of Moon Dongyun, I think is his name, and uh, Packing Ten, against Gunba of Boston, and Damon, the head coach of Paris. I think that's going to be great. I think Gunba and Damon have got a chance to say, listen, we were the powerhouses behind LA Valiant's strate strategy. Watch as we destroy you with these new teams that we've uh, gone and imparted our wisdom towards. I think that's going to be a great clash of the minds. Even if Damon isn't as involved strategically as he was on uh, on the LA Valiant, and it's more delegated to guys like Sater or uh, uh, Feifei or... Um, uh, Kai Kai, these kind of people. Um, but even so, I think that's going to be a really cool rivalry when Gumba and Demon play against the LA Valiant, against their former teams. And maybe even against each other, they'll have a little bit of rivalry there. Another great one, if we're going to talk about Demon and Paris, is Kai Kai versus Aero and Jane. That's a classic. Now, it's slightly different because Kai Kai isn't really in charge of the team in the same way that Aero and Jane or Huck or Krusty or Pavane or Wizard Hyong or Ryu or Bishop or Brad are in charge of the team. Kai Kai is an assistant coach. Is he an assistant coach? I think his title is assistant coach, but I remember him getting a little bit pissy about this before. Liquipedia Kai Kai, is, is, it might just be coach, his title. Let me Let me look it up. Let's go. Pa He's currently an assistant coach. He's listed as assistant coach, all right? So you can't get fucking pissy with me about that. All right, so 
but you can see what I mean, right? Kaikai doesn't have control over the team in the same in the same way that Arrow uh, does over his. Um, but I think that's a great rivalry, and will certainly be a storyline to bring up when those two teams face each other, Paris and Dallas. Especially because you know Jane's been talking a little bit smack on some teams' ability to play goats. Paris is the goats team. But how much really did Kai Kai bring to that? I'm not so sure. But I think that Kai Kai is a very intelligent player. I think Reddit gave him way too much shit. I don't know whether he was really the best head coach. That's fair enough to say that, you know, he's maybe more fit for an assistant or strategic coach kind of position rather than being the holistic guy that looks after the mental health of the players and how the team works and benching and uh, making sure that people are happy with how everything's working and doing the strategy. Fair enough. That That's a fair critique. Um, but Kai Kai himself is actually a pretty experienced guy with a good knowledge of the game and is going to offer stuff to Paris and will make the matchup of Paris v, v Dallas very interesting. And not just in the GOATS meta, but in future metas as well. I think any time Paris play against Dallas, which um, they are in... Are they both in Atlantic? No, Dallas is in... I think it, it'll only happen once this season unless they make stage or final playoffs. But it's going to be very interesting either way. Another, uh, to close this topic of uh, coaching battles in 2018, I want to talk about some bigger picture stuff. In, in 2018, we saw uh, coaching styles could be roughly categorized as reactive versus active, and then counter-stratting. Uh, reactive coaching, I think, is uh, where you make your team play the most disciplined style of Overwatch possible, you really prioritize positioning, and you have a plan for everything that the opposition is going to be able to do. So the, t the teams and coaches that really exemplified this are Pervain and Wizard Young uh, with the NYXL where the structure was perfect. They played a style where they forced the enemies to dive into them and forced the enemies to make mistakes. Their positioning was great. The way they spread around the map was excellent. Their collapses were really good. Very structured style of Overwatch that forces mistakes out of the enemy and then you react to it. The other team is LA Valiant with Moon and, you know, Gumber and Damon. Uh, positioning, again, high priority, making sure that you're making the correct decisions and peeling for your teammates, keeping everybody alive, squeezing the opposition. You don't need big flashy plays. You just need your fundamentals to work really well. When we compare this to active styles of coaching, I would say certainly uh, Krusty and to a lesser extent Huck with Boston, where they had a super aggressive style. They're going to make the plays. They're going to get in your face. They're going to uh, win the fights. They're not going to make sure they have control of the fight. They're going to rip control of the fight away from you. So that is kind of the style that I mean when I say active. To a lesser extent, I'd say Hayes and Named Kui on Philadelphia Fusion also have this style. Philadelphia Fusion are an aggressive team. They like to get in your face. They like to play a bit chaotic. They like to set EQO and Carpe up to have big plays. So it's not reactive and controlled and measured. It's very much, we've got the pieces to be able to batter your fucking head in, and we're going to put them in position to do that and help them do that and play aggressively. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how those two styles... Uh, work when we move into uh, 2019 as well. I suppose as well that you could put the London coaches more in the active style, but personally, I don't really think the London coaches had more had that much to do with it. I think that was more the players, Bedoshan, Gesture, Profit, really coming together and, and working on that style themselves. Maybe that's my ignorance of the London coaching staff. Maybe it's just the fact that they speak Korean and I've had difficulty being able to actually tell how much they do in the team, more so than other Western coaches. But you know, we could put them in that group as well. The other style that I really want to uh, just close this video on is counter-stratting, which is something that the London Gladiators... Uh, London Gladiators, why do I always say that? The LA Gladiators are really good at. Gladiators are by far and away the team that's come out with the most niche strategies, set plays, counter-strats. I mean, this season alone, we've only had one week of it, and already we've seen Sure 4 come out on a Symmetra pick as, like, a set strategy, and we've seen um, Gladiators improve so much from match one to match two because they were able to watch tape of, uh, of Shock and abuse how aggressive they were. I mean, such good counter-stressing from, uh, from LA Gladiators uh, to be able to punish the San Francisco Shock in that way. So 
I think that's a really interesting style where the Gladiators aren't really the most structured team in the world and they aren't really the most aggressive, um, active team in the world, but they sure as hell seem to be have a great read on how to break other teams' styles. So that's going to be a fantastic story to try and watch throughout the season as well and to try and find who these coaches are and give them credit for it. So I think we're in for an incredibly exciting season even if you take the players out of it and just look at the coaches.